My name is Bob Goodman. I'm the executive director of the New Jersey Center for Teaching and Learning and a teacher of science and engineering at Bergen County Technical High School in Teterboro. Thank you so much for having me come here to uh, tape my remarks about the program that we've developed at Bergen Tech that's having a big effect on science and mathematics education. Um, I became a teacher in 1999 uh, when I started the pre-engineering program at Bergen County Technical High School. And when I did that, the superintendent who hired me indicated that uh, the students I was getting in had all taken Algebra 1 in 8th grade. And as a result, during the academic part of the day, they were all scheduled to be in uh, biology and geometry. And we're skipping algebra. And that seemed like an okay idea until the first day of school when I asked the kids, and only three of the 16 kids had actually had algebra in eighth grade. And that posed a real problem because they weren't going to take it at all if I didn't teach it to them. And the way Votex work, or at least they do out by in New Jersey, is that students get about two hours in their vocational major every day, and the rest of the day is spent in academic study. So what I decided to do, since I could do anything I wanted with my two hours, uh, just like the culinary or fashion design uh, majors could do, is I divided my two hours into 40 minutes for learning algebra, 40 minutes for taking pre-engineering computer-aided design, and 40 minutes for doing algebra-based physics. And the algebra is pretty clear why I did that, and the engineering is pretty clear because it was a pre-engineering major. What's less clear to people is why I chose algebra-based physics. And that was really a lot to do with my background, perhaps, which is that um, I had majored in physics at MIT, so I had a strong orientation towards physics. But a lot of it had to do with my understanding that uh, physics is required by engineering students more than any other subject. And you can check that yourself just by looking at any of your university catalogs and you look up the majors that are STEM majors and you're going to see that 90% of them require physics and about 80% require chemistry and 60% require biology. Uh, almost none of them require the other sciences. So all sciences really aren't equal. And so if I wanted my pre-engineering kids to be successful in engineering school, which is the whole point of a pre-engineering program, then I needed them to learn uh, some physics. That was one reason. The other reason is that I was going to be teaching them algebra and these kids were clearly not uh, a, you know, ahead a, a of their peers in terms of algebra understanding, since uh, a lot of eighth graders in New Jersey do take algebra, and these kids hadn't. And I didn't want to just teach it to them the same way that it had been taught before. So I taught them an algebra course that was unique, but I also wanted to ha them to have a use for the algebra. So algebra-based physics was mathematically rigorous, uh, but it only used algebra. And as a result, rather than constantly saying, when am I ever going to use this, which is a refrain I heard from students when I went through other schools, uh, these students never really said that because they were using algebra all the time. The problem I faced was that there were no algebra-based physics books in the United States because in the United States, uh, science is always taught in the sequence or usually taught in the sequence, biology, chemistry, and then physics. And the kids who get to physics are the best and the brightest in their high schools and their 11th or 12th graders. So they're all in trig or calculus, and therefore all the books in the United States for physics that are mathematical are trig and calculus. And the ones that aren't mathematical wouldn't serve my purpose because I wanted the mathematics. It was important to me. So as a result, I spent my nights and weekends while I was teaching that first year writing an algebra-based physics book from scratch. Um, I designed it to, be dr to draw topics from the advanced placement physics exam because I also needed these kids to be able to uh, demonstrate what they knew and could do on an objective national test because otherwise uh, no one would believe that Votec kids were actually as good in physics as these kids were going to be. So uh, I designed the course. It was very successful. I had to develop a new pedagogy for it. They hadn't in the past been really strong in math and science, so if I taught it the same way it had been taught, that would be a difficulty. There was another reason I chose to teach it a different way, which was that when I got to my classroom the first day, or actually a couple days before school's op school opened up, uh, there were no tables in my classroom at all. And that was because the administration thought I was going to spend two hours a day just doing computer-aided design, and therefore the kids just needed computer desks. They didn't need tables uh, where they could sit and take notes, or, and there was no blackboard in the room where I could write anything down. So uh, recognizing that wouldn't work with my algebra-based algebra, algebra -based physics courses, um, I looked around the school and the only tables I could find were round tables in the faculty room that they used for lunch or whatever. So I just folded them up and uh, rolled them down the hallway to my classroom. So I picked up four tables for my 16 students. Uh, and then I found a blackboard in the warehouse and rolled that into the room. And before you knew it, I had a new social constructivist pedagogy 
because now the kids were going to sit around round tables when they were in class. And that's just because round tables roll better than square tables. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done it. But it turned out to be something that really goes through our whole pedagogy and our approach to teaching and learning. Well, the course turned out to be really successful. I would do a brief direct instruction of something. I'd explain something to the kids for like five or six minutes. And then the kids would, uh, then I'd give them a problem to work on for a few minutes and they'd work together and then we'd talk about it and then we'd do another problem, another problem. So maybe 75, 80% of my class was the kids sitting around round tables talking to each other, which it turns out that ninth graders love to do. So if you give them a chance to sit around tables and talk to each other, they'll be happy. So this became like their favorite class. And they were learning really rigorous AP level, really, uh, physics because all my topics were from AP physics and AP physics is 90% just algebra anyway. And so as a result, uh, the, the word went out in the school that this was a great course to the point where halfway through the first year, we started, the principal started getting petitions and requests from the students in other majors, culinary, fashion, design, cosmetology, to take physics themselves. Like, why weren't they allowed to take physics? Uh, within a few years, everyone in the school was taking this ninth grade physics course. Uh, and these were kids who were below average in math uh, based on state test scores in eighth grade. Uh, but they were doing pretty well at it, and anyone who wanted to. So the sequence then became, we shifted it to be physics. Everyone took physics in ninth grade. Then they took a chemistry course in 10th grade. Then they took biology in 11th grade. And each of the subsequent courses is built on the physics and mathematics they learned in ninth grade. So it all made sort of a great sense. And I could talk more about that later, but the sequence has a, a very important aspect to it. Um, and they were all doing that, and that anyone who wanted to could take the advanced placement course for physics, for instance, in 10th grade while they were taking chemistry. And because everyone in the school was in the same class, everyone was taking basically pre-AP physics. I didn't have to pick who was going to take physics. They could pick it themselves. Uh, within, by 2003, so four years after we started, um, everyone was uh, doing really well at this. By 2005, we were number one in the state for the percentage of kids taking and passing advanced placement physics. And in fact, we were double the number two school in the state and 13 times the state average, which was really good. So as a result, the Commissioner of Education chose me to be the state teacher of the year for New Jersey, so, uh, which was a great honor. He's 100,000 teachers in New Jersey, so finding me was nice of her. But uh, that, that also gave me a chance then to go to the White House and meet the president and get a smart board and get a request from the Department of Education for how I could bring this to all the students in New Jersey instead of just the kids in my Votech. Um, it turned out all that worked together because we figured out how we could uh, migrate the content into a form that we could send to other schools. One of the big problems is how do you have a school adopt a textbook that doesn't exist in the form of a textbook? So what we did was we, I also got a student teacher. So I had a student teacher and a smart board and smart notebook and we started migrating all of my course that I'd written in Word in my basement uh, into smart notebooks that we could share with people so we could migrate the content out to other schools if they wanted to teach our physics, chemistry, and biology course in that sequence, uh, or the AP courses for that, which had already also been developed. Um, so we started doing that. Then the other problem that we had to deal with was that the other schools didn't have physics teachers. Um, the United States has about 36,000 fewer physics teachers than it has biology teachers. So if you want everyone in the United States to take physics who's currently taking biology, you'll find you're short about 36,000 teachers. And higher ed is right on this because higher ed is creating about 300 new physics teachers every year. So in about 120 years, we'll have met the need. Uh, we figured that wasn't gonna be something we could wait for, so we decided to start creating our own physics teachers and the Department of Education helped us with that along with the teachers union. And they allowed us to have a program where we would take teachers of any subject and teach them physics to make them physics teachers which is the opposite of the normal approach, but it turned out to be really a good idea for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, there are a lot more teachers than there are physics majors. There's about three and a half million teachers in the United States. So if you convert 1% to physics, then you've got 35,000 physics teachers. Uh, there's only 6,000 physics majors in the United States, so you'd have to convert 600% of them. So just on the face of it, it's impossible to get enough physics teachers by just getting physics majors to become teachers. And most of physics majors don't want to be teachers, but most teachers do want to be teachers. So it's a, it's a way better solution. Turned out the first year we did this, we immediately became the number one producer of physics teachers in the United States and have stayed number one every year since we, we began in 2009. 
Um, that work was made possible by the New Jersey Center for Teaching and Learning. I was asked to be on the board of the center uh, when I became Teacher of the Year. The center was newly formed by the New Jersey Education Association, and it was formed by the president of the NJEA because she realized that teachers were going to be held accountable for student outcomes. So if she wanted to help her members, she couldn't just work on deal with wages and pensions and benefits. She also had to help them be more effective teachers. So she formed the nonprofit Center for Teaching and Learning. That center was the, was the organization that I started on as the board in 2009 when we ramped up this program to create physics teachers. Um, I became the executive director and we had those two employees. My student teacher became an employee. I was an employee. And the two of us became, we outdid all of higher education in the first year in terms of producing physics teachers. Um, we now have about 10 people, and that's for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, we're now bringing this to other places in the United States, uh, and also outside of the United States. We've got major projects with the World Bank in West Africa, um, but as well as other states in the United States who have the same problem, which is how are they going to get their kids to be really good at math and science and to the point where they can go off into these engineering jobs. In a, in a sense, what we had done is create an on-ramp to STEM career paths because we could take kids at any age, basically, and by combining together this science sequence and the math sequence that matched it, we could get, we can remediate all the problems they had in their past and in one year have them up to be internationally competitive basically in math and science. So we did this with ninth graders that were below average. We went to other schools and did it with their ninth, 11th, and 12th graders. Uh, we believe we could do it with community colleges and four-year colleges. So the kids at any point in their life, if they choose to become, uh, to go down a STEM career path, they can do it. Right now that's not possible for most kids because if they do try to make that transition, they pick up a physics course in college, they're probably going to struggle mightily compared to kids who have studied physics who were in the same class with them. So that's a major thing that's happened. The other thing we did was we had a lot of requests to take the same approach that was so effective with high school and bring it to lower grades. So uh, over the course of time, we've now extended, we've created this materials down to kindergarten uh, and up to 12th grade in mathematics and science. And we've been able, because we're designing both the math and the science, we can tie them both together so that they make sense together with each other. Uh, we eliminate the need for textbooks because all these materials are online uh, to be downloaded by teachers. They're all free since they're all funded by the teachers union, the NEA, the NJEA, Thompson Family Foundation, family foundations and public corporations. And they're just donating the money to do this to, in order to help teachers everywhere in the world. Uh, last 12 months, we've had uh, 1.7 million file downloads from 180 countries and all 50 states, people downloading these files to make their classrooms more effective. So this is a case where the technology, rather than being in competition with classroom education like a MOOC or an online course is, this is using technology to enable better instruction within the classroom. And the technology that's involved in this is just an interactive whiteboard or projector and a student polling device. And what's happened is every, every course that we write there is, broken, is made up of topics. And a topic is brief instruction, maybe five or six minutes, six or seven smart notebook slides explaining something pretty simple. Uh, and then six formative assessment questions. Which, are at that, which basically as the teacher goes to the next slide, teacher doesn't have to say anything. The slide asks the students a question. The teacher uh, then sort of stands back and lets the students talk around their round tables, debate it, discuss it, put in their answers. When you get the polling results out, you're, you're based on those results. If they're all right a couple times in a row, you can skip to the next topic. If they're all wrong, you can go back and figure out what didn't work so well with the teaching. And if they're mixed, you tell the kids to find someone with a different answer and argue about it. And so you end up with a class where 80% of the time, the kids are talking to each other doing stuff, and only 20 or 25% of the, the time is the teacher doing stuff. And kids like that way better. I actually was in a class the other day, and I tried to explain this to the teacher, that every time she started talking, after a couple of minutes, the kids all slumped back in their chairs and started texting and stuff. And every time the question came up for them to do, they all leaned forward in their chairs and started talking to each other and started working on the problem. And I just wanted to say, where do, where do you think more learning was happening? When they were sitting back trying to think of something else to occupy their mind, or when they were talking to each other to help each other? Um, this also gets into the whole issue of tracking, um, which I could talk about separately, but I could also just mention here that we don't track at all. Uh, every student, the special ed kids, and the kids who eventually go on to MIT are all in the same class together. They're sitting around the same round tables. And we found that really effective. 
There were some people who thought that we'd be holding back the top kids, but that didn't prove to be the case at all. In fact, the top kids get to be much better by having to constantly explain their solutions to the kids who have less adequate background coming into the class. So it brings up the weaker kids because they like have a one-to-one -one tutor basically helping them out. And it brings up the stronger kids because th by explaining this, you never really understand something until you go to teach it. And when they go to teach it, they realize they really didn't understand it, but now they do. As a result, our school has had, you know, these are, again, this is, this is a traditional vocational technical school. We have a sister school that's a math science academy. All these kids were either rejected from getting into the math science academy or didn't even think to apply. But now they're, they're now taking AP physics and, and passing it at three times the rate of the math and science academy. And uh, these kids are getting, we've now had our seventh kid just accepted at MIT. We've had kids accepted at MIT, Princeton, Yale, Harvard, another kid at Princeton this year. Um, top schools in the country, having come from a background where they couldn't get into the better uh, magnet schools in the, in the county. So uh, if they were held back by, help, by being in the classes with the weaker students, it doesn't show up by the outcomes. Um, also, we encourage them to stay after school and help the kids. And we let every kid take retests if they want to improve their grade because our point of view is really it's, uh, what, it's what they know before they end the class. It's not when they know it during the school year. Uh, so we, when we post the materials on our website, we post the presentations, quizzes, tests, homework, unit plans. The homework always has answers because we don't count for grades anything other than what the kids do in front of us. So the homework assignment is given to them along with the answers and their goal is to do the homework and then match it against the answers so that when they go to take a quiz or a test, they know that they already know the material. Um, but they could stay after school if they want to take a test over again, and we have multiple versions of every test already posted, and they're all in Word. All the materials I'm talking about are editable, so any teacher who doesn't like the way we've done it uh, can change it. Now, we've, we've given them 100,000 slides in Smart Notebook, which is a lot. Like, if you went to look at them and looked for 30 seconds a slide, it would be more than 35 days without sleep. Uh, so no one could do it themselves. And, but uh, together, this group of teachers all around the world who collaborate on this has been able to do it. So uh, the net result of all of this work is to raise teaching and learning to a higher level. It's all led by a foundation started by the teachers union, supported by teachers unions. The teachers union through this foundation is creating more physics teachers than higher ed is creating in any school. Um, this is a real clear example, I think, of where the teachers are leading the profession. That's said a lot, but if you, you can, it's easy to say, but this is an example where it's really the case. Where we're creating the teachers, we're creating the materials, so we're not going to textbook manufacturers to do it. Created the pedagogy, the teaching and learning approach. Everything is driven by teachers, and the continuous improvement of these materials occurs because they're used by teachers who give us feedback to make it better. So I'd like to just summarize by saying that uh, this has been an adventure for me to be involved in all of this. It's a uh, an extension of, uh, I, I'm kind of um, new to teaching. It wasn't my first career, but I've loved this career. And I'm really happy to have had any positive effect on the teaching and learning of students outside of my uh, purview. Thank you so much. <laughs>